Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, beaming in directly into your brain, you're listening to the Spartacast League, and I am Phelan. Joining us today are Attica and Eno, so get ready and strap in. But before we officially get to the show tonight, I have a couple things that I would like to address. The first is a listener did send us some feedback off of Google+. Plus. The moderator, Comrade Genie, over there, one of the largest leftist communities on the website, wrote, Great show. Keep up the good work. We are listening and supporting you, comrades. And it was a pleasure to listen to every show of yours when I clean my rifles or have some work that doesn't make so much noise. I love it. Especially the rifle cleaning. So definitely keep that up. That's pretty funny, because I like to clean my rifles when we're recording. Yeah, if you listen really closely, sometimes you can actually hear the the clicks there from that. So if you're paying a little bit of attention, you may hear that. (laughs) But we are definitely pro-gun here. (laughs) I'm just a gross gay furry who's saving gay furry porn in the background as we do the show. That's my great contribution. That's my praxis. That's an important and practical contribution to a cultural revolution moving forward on the ground floor like we are. I even photoshop hammers and sickles and stuff in ways that will make the propaganda into pornaganda. I honestly think there's a future in pornaganda, like furries could spearhead this movement. Don't use the term porn and spearhead in the same sentence, please. (laughs) Well, you know what Karl Marx said about furry porn is, he said the working class must always be availed to furry porns and the means of production thereof. Any attempt to remove the furry porn from the working class must be frustrated by force if necessary. Look that up. It's in uh, Das Kapital. Actually, I think he said that at a speech that he did in uh, 1849. No, that was the gun thing. The porn thing's in Das Kapital. He put it in his book because it's very important. Yeah. And, and no one will get to it because the book is like three bricks wide. The other thing that I did want to get to here on a uh, more solemn note is some of you uh, might have known Art Bell, a very famous paranormal late night radio host. He founded the show Coast to Coast AM. Uh, he's someone I greatly respected, even though I did not agree with any of his politics. He passed away back in April, but a toxicology report did come in, and it does look like we do have some closure on on how he died there. So he had COPD in the late stages, and he had a lot of back pain as well. And it looks like that he may have accidentally overdosed on various painkillers. He was prescribed three opioids and an anticonvulsant. And, of course, it's, it's very easy to see how, how that could happen there. And it really just kind of goes to show that even, even people that are, that are well-to-do and, and well-off, they go to the doctors, they get the same treatment a lot of times that anybody else, else would get, which is a laundromat of prescriptions. And sometimes they can conflict, and sometimes they just throw on the painkillers. A prescription tinned advice and a hefty bill that's healthcare in america well where is politics i didn't even because art bill is just something like from my childhood that i only knew like through association whenever phil hendry would pretend to be art bell online the few times i listened to art bell i didn't actually really get it he was moderate ish and he turned heavy right towards the end of his life Uh, unfortunately he was he was pro trump before he died, uh, which, like I said, I, I don't agree with his politics, but he always had the most fascinating interviews. He didn't put up with bullshit on, on his shows. He called callers out, which was always fun, and he even called the guests out, and he didn't softball questions. So I think as far as, as especially within his particular topic, where it's really easy uh, especially on a, on a paranormal show, to just softball questions to somebody to just get them on, on the air and everything and willing to talk about what it is, it takes a different kind of persona to actually press somebody on it and challenge people. And he did that, and that's what I always liked about his show, is he wouldn't 100% agree with his guests, and he often would challenge them on it. So you're saying that 
a paranormal show about fake space ghosts was more challenging and pressing to its guests and people it interviewed than Ben Shapiro. That Art Bell was, on all accounts, a better journalist <laughs> than any of these, like, alt-right wannabe TPUSA smiley boys. Oh god, definitely yes. He did He did a second show called Midnight in the Desert that was on air a few years. A different guy does it, Dave Schrader. He kind of continues that legacy now. But when he was doing Midnight in the Desert, he actually had two guys come on and they debated global warming, I believe it was. No, no, it wasn't global warming. It was they debated Flat Earth and... Unfortunately, the the actual physicist, the uh, anti flat earther, the realist, was just like, "No, I can't do this anymore. This guy's being obnoxious." <laughs> but <laughs> the fact that he didn't let the flat earther just run roughshod over the person, he actually called the guy out numerous times and even admitted, "Hey." I don't agree with what you're pushing here. And it was it was great entertaining radio. And after the interview and the debate, he actually did throw out a few jokes afterwards at the guy's expense. It was kind of funny. So I guess the real question is how old are you, Phelan? That is a secret, but it's I'm 34 on the 24th. <laughs> Damn, you're like just getting to gay dad age. I am unaccustomed to not being the oldest person in the room. Moving on to our first topic here. <laughs> MSNBC, the Resistance Network. The Oh, God. Of course. Yeah, you know where this is going. It's so fucking... Okay, so, like, since I got another Twitter and I've been interacting with these people, they're just weird on another level. And I can see how their chatter totally makes them think that there's this great blue wave coming because they've all psyched themselves out into all being like their own personal Captain America, fucking hanging pictures of Muller in, you know, above their bed next to Jesus because he's, you know, fighting Trump or something. They're just weird. They're not bad people. They're not nuts. Like, it's not like when, you know, the alt-right goes off the loony leftists. But they are very weird people. Yeah, no, I I totally get you on that. I actually saw a few of those interactions, and, and they were funny. I, I love the guy that labeled you as a bot when, like, you have a full-on, like, persona as your Yeah, as your he labeled I mean, me as a bot because I was talking about Marx. And, God, it's scary because they fucking goose themselves into this mind frame where anything that isn't just hauling right away on the railroad against Trump, like anything that isn't Trump bad, liberals good, Mueller is God incarnate, is, you know, just seen as divisive Russian propaganda trying to divide America. It's almost fashy in and of itself. I'm not stupid enough to say, oh, the liberals are the real fascists or anything, but it is really disconcerting how easily they've fallen into that mindset of anything that isn't, anything that, that brings up a new, uh, you know, another idea on their side, you know, also against Trump, also against everything that's going on, an explanation for it that isn't just the already decided common consensus of the resistance is just evil Russian bot, you know, I, I want to dividing throw America. This out. I want to throw this out here. So do you th think that they just don't know what the word bot actually means and they think it's like some Russian thing? Well, no, so, I mean, uh, most of them are boomers who, like, can barely open the Twitter app. I don't think they have a concept of really what a bot is. Because, you know, they conflate bot Russian bots with Russian hackers. It's just Russia bad is all that it is. Because, you know, you, you can't simultaneously be both a bot and a hacker. It, it, it's, well, it's, it's, not even a, it's not even a hacker. It's a sock puppet is the proper term. And I really wish they would stop using the term hacker in that manner. Because one, what most people consider a hacker is actually a cracker and not like a white person. So if you're trying to gain access to a system you're, you don't have the right to, that's called cracking. 
hacking is just any activity uh, with a with a computer, you know, any complex variety, uh, particularly that requires exploration. So that could be cracking per se, but hacking also just refers to coding for the most part. Like a hack fest is like a computer event where you go and you make code. But Getting back to the original point here, the resistance network, MSNBC, always, always on top of Donald Trump. They give you the latest on Stormy Daniels. 455 stories last year from July 3rd to July 3rd of this year, but not a word on U.S. involvement in Yemen. And this is something that we've covered on this show, but also something other news agencies such as PBS NewsHour have actually done plenty of work not only covering it but pbs breaking ground with stories where the major media msnbc in particular it's like we're not even there i think jimmy Dore said it best jimmy Dore here when he said that msnbc and cnn that they're not news which isn't news to anyone like they're not news but they're not quite just propaganda outlets he used the specific word, they're, they're PR firms, they're public relations, and that is exactly what they are. They're public relations for the Democratic Party and, you know, the bourgeoisie, essentially. Because they're not, you know, they don't exactly pump out propaganda of, you know, America is great and love your boss, but they do rep corporate interests, uh, corporate politicians, and put a nice shiny coat on like Starbucks reducing its plastic or whatever. You know, that gets a big story because it's public relations for a gigantic company that is a big donor to the party, which, you know, basically owns these stations and doesn't talk about, you know, the killing of children in Yemen. It's not full blown like, you know, 1984 propaganda out of the speaker box, but it is public relations is what, what these channels are. Uh, and I think that's the best way I've heard it described so far. Well, that, and if you, like I said in a previous episode, if you look at who funds all of these news networks, it's companies like Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, etc., or it's pharmaceutical companies. And so it's very easy to imagine why a news organization would sit on or not run with a story if it is counter to the interests of the military industrial complex which it would be in this particular case because most of the civil war involvement in yemen is actually done through drones and other devices powered by raytheon we know that there is a hard limit to how in cahoots the higher levels of government and corporate powers are because msnbc probably wouldn't have run that many stories on stormy daniels if raytheon paid her off instead of trump well, that, and they have to fill the time somehow, so might as well fill it with junk, I guess. Remember back in the 90s when the filler was, uh, a flashlight was found in the middle of a road, it might be a pipe bomb, or these firefighters have rescued six entire puppies this week, and now the filler is the person who occupies the highest office in the land absolutely had an affair with a pornography actress in order to draw attention away from the fact that our military is passively involved in a literal genocide. The thing is, is that these companies are incredibly profitable. The United States spent $177 million just in Syria. So we're not even talking in Yemen here. Just in Syria, $177 million dollars worth of missiles and drones were spent that could have went to feed 1,242 children according to Amity Underground and that's children in the United States. So if we didn't drop all those missiles on Syria plus Yemen as well, we could have fed a lot of hungry kids here in this country. And this is a country in the United States, the richest one in the world, one out of every five children go to bed hungry. And then to top it off, there's a good chance that a lot of these kids that are starving in this crisis in Yemen if wouldn't be in this situation to begin with. 50,000 children died last year 
from hunger. Almost a third of the country right now, 8 million people, are at risk for starvation. And that number, like we reported a few weeks ago, is going to balloon up to 18 million in a country with under 30 million people. And again, the price point of a single Tomahawk cruise missile being able to feed 1,200-ish U.S. children, you got to understand that in Yemen and a lot of other parts of the Middle East and that part of the world, the average income that supports a family is between 60 and $90 a month U.S. If you talk about feeding Syrian or Yemeni's children, you're probably upping that figure by five or tenfold. So the amount of money that is going in to kill and maim these people and destroy their infrastructure, it could have went into making these people's lives better. But of course, the you know that's not in the interest of the military industrial complex. What makes all of this, so the fact that we could be feeding these children and everything, in the United States, of course, and across the world. But instead, we're choosing military action. Is there's no demand on the left, it seems, or at least liberal America, because they don't know that these actions are going on. There's no rallies for them. Counterpunch did a great write-up. Liberals are protesting over everything right now. They are protesting the Supreme Court pick. They are protesting ICE. Uh, they're protesting the Russia investigation, which, good, I definitely agree. We need protests there. That is important. But the other thing is, is we absolutely need an anti-war movement in this country right now because the military industrial complex is running roughshod over the world right now. We need to show solidarity with the Yemenis people and with other peoples that our military is just going in and absolutely decimating their, their culture and society and killing them. And if we don't, then we do run the risk of heavy, heavy blowback. Now that, of course, is not trying to say in any way or not trying to imply in any way that these issues that we are protesting, <laughs> rather that the very large number of liberals are protesting are less important. We are not trying to undercut the gravity of every other thing that the American left, be it soft left or regular left, is protesting. It's hard to even fault the left for this, right? Because most people, like we just covered, they don't know that it's happening. And so that's just one part of the equation here. So people need to be aware that this genocide is happening in their names and that people in Yemen are being radicalized and being told that the United States, the great Satan and its evil inhabitants by some of these groups are using terminologies like that to refer to, to us because our government goes in under our name and tax dollars and absolutely slaughters these people, cuts them off of their food supplies, starving them. Well, back here on the home front, as Comrade G.I. Ivan said uh, famously, knowing is half the battle. Overseas, we do need to make shows of solidarity. We, we do need to let them know that the American left is not solely concerned with American issues. We need an anti-war movement because war affects our leftist brethren overseas. It affects our fellow working class. While these aren't issues that directly affect any of us, leftism is not about borders and countries and languages and creeds and races. Leftism is intersectional and international. The fact is, these are people just like us who are getting destroyed by a system that we are unwillingly and unwittingly at this point party to. Again, knowing is half the battle. We need to spread the word about this so as to foment dissent about this on a large scale and a larger level. I would even argue to say that it does affect us in a negative manner, just the regular people, because whose children is it that they send over to die for these causes anytime that there's a war? It's, it's not the wealthy children. It's not the children of senators. Those people rarely volunteer. The people that die during the war, the people that go over, it's just 
regular people from working class communities, oftentimes poorer people that didn't really have much of a choice or future if they would have stayed in their own communities. There's a lot of communities where your career choice is join the army or join a gang. Well, that is an excellent point and one that we need to bear in mind. And I thank you for bringing it up. I would argue that this particular case, the genocide in Yemen, is particularly worrisome to me because we do see insurgency and counterinsurgency efforts undertaken by our government in the shadows. We have seen that in the past, but something on this scale, it's happening right now, it's not going to affect most regular middle class people. And what really concerns me about it is this honestly looks like the template for United States intervention for many years to come. This is absolutely devastating. It's fairly cheap as United States interventionary wars go, and it's happening so subtly right under the noses of everyone. The only thing that we're really missing is mass media coverage. The only thing that could expose this, like other wars in the past have been exposed, is mass media coverage. When you have our wounded veterans coming back on airplanes, and when, when you have movies about the Iraq war and the Afghanistan war and all the cool stuff Delta and SEALs do, people are aware of that. But people aren't aware of this because there's no profound effect on the working class of America right now. There's no veterans dying over in Yemen or, or coming back crippled or coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. There's just drone operators and a lot of money changing hands very quickly. And it seems like this is a very, very effective proxy war, shadow war, whatever you would like to call it. It seems like this might very well be our template for intervention far into the future. And if this is the case, then the only thing they have to do to get away with it is avoid the mass media covering it. And that is frightening. The important thing to point out here is this is not a Trump issue. This war has been going on for three years in Yemen. The Syrian civil war has been going on since well, 2009 or, or so. It, it's been a long time. These wars are not something that is a Trump thing. This was initiated under Obama. This is part of his doctrine and policy. And for Democrats and liberals that think that they're just going to vote in yet another neoliberal establishment figure and get change, you got another thing coming. You're going to get the same thing that you've been getting for 30 years. This is how the neoliberals operate under standard procedure. This is not a Trump doctrine. In that light, it handily makes a case against the accelerationist idea that Trump getting into office was a good thing because it woke a lot of people up because not a lot of people are woke to this. It seems, of course, like MSNBC, the hashtag resistance network and their fellows, they happily lay everything at the feet of the terrible orange tic tac colored monster they look up to and praise our charming chocolate colored former leader. It seems like this really ugly sort of dichotomy. It's, it's too clean. It's, it's, it's too neat. Obama good. Trump bad. And the accelerationist idea is that people are getting more woke now that Trump is in office and they're starting to look around and realize how bad American politics are and have been. And I'm not seeing quite a lot of that. What I'm seeing is the news covering that Trump is bad and that Obama was good. But in fact, a lot of these policies, including, as we've discussed in previous episodes, the immigration and customs enforcement policies that have been hitting so hard back home here were initiated under the Obama administration. The time for the anti-war movement in America is now, and we should not accept the killing of especially children in our name. Because the second that we do, the second that we condone this, is the second that we as Americans abandon justice and give the people that we are told are our enemies the justification to to attack us and that's not saying that american citizens deserve what's coming because no they don't most of them are so uninvolved in everything and uninformed they don't have any idea this is happening if they had the information if if they knew what the government was doing in their name I think that more people would be willing to stand up and say no. 
but we need to get there and we need to build an anti-war movement in this country because things are building right now and it's not looking pretty. Speaking of genocide, I, I did want to cover some stuff that's going on in Palestine right now. So a report came out that 32 children were killed between January 1st and the 14th of July of this year. Most of them were killed by being shot or through drone strikes. The interesting thing about how they're shooting them is they are going for kill shots when dealing with these kids. And this is actually a callback to a policy that they implemented during the first and second intifadas where they deliberately would shoot children in the heart, neck, or head to create the most bloodiest looking kill shots and the reason is they would take the photos of this and they would spread it around so that the Palestinians would see this and would fear them. So this is using the killing of children for psychological warfare, which is incredibly sick. Well, it seems pretty appropriate and pretty well in holding with IDF's tactics up to this point in history. It's gruesome, it's unacceptable, it's clever, and it's efficient. These people are monsters, but you can't call them stupid. It goes to show that they're still continuing the same tactics they've been doing since the, the 80s, because I believe the Intifada was, the first one was during the 80s sometime. It was incredibly, incredibly bloody. It does not surprise me at all that this is continuing. The other point that I wanted to make is, in addition to the shock factor that they are using the genocide in Palestine is a complete both cultural, ethnic cleansing, as well as the concentration camp style, shove them in there and, and basically just kind of slowly kill them off. So the other thing that they're doing right now to basically kill out the Palestinian culture is they're shutting down schools and universities as well. And there were two examples of schools being shut down. Well, one, a university where they shut it down because the professors had given a conference that Israeli authorities did not approve of. So they placed the professors under house arrest and they basically closed down the university thereafter. One of the things about Palestinian universities is that Israel controls their curriculum. So they have a heavy Zionist curriculum in the schools already presently. So there is no academic freedom there. And the second school that they demolished was actually a kindergarten. And that one doubled as a kindergarten and a women's cultural center. And funny enough, the children's school, the kindergarten, was actually on land that was owned by the Vatican. So this was basically a humanitarian project and it was called Pope Mountain. And the reason that that one was closed down was because the Israelis said that they didn't have the permit to build, which is something that they'll often do in Israel is they will tell them that you built this, but you didn't have a permit, but they'll put a double standard on Israeli settlements and allow them to build without permits and then retroactively issue them the permit later. Here again, we see bureaucracy wielded as a weapon against the lower class. Right. Well, bureaucracy in this case to uh, further uh, an agenda for, for ethnic cleansing, just straight up. Yes, precisely. This is uh, a war on all fronts. And it really is. And it just it continues because the, the, the other story that came up this week was that the Israeli army destroyed a water pipeline to build a road uh, into a village. And this is a village that was already in one of their special zones that they could basically evacuate the village at any time, hold military operations, and basically annex the territory under that premise if they so wanted to. In this particular instance, they just cut the water off to the village. And this is something that they keep doing over and over again. And this is how ethnic cleansing works, is you work at it through many different fronts and you use the entire bureaucracy. And this is why it is so insidious. Well, the practical upshot of all of this is that uh, Israel is making an absolute killing in the private sector. They are learning a lot from their backyard genocide. They're selling that information on the free market, as is their right, I 
suppose. Israel has basically monetized their apartheid state at this point. One of the things that they actually have done is they actually train the NYPD. So if you ever wonder like what's up with the NYPD, yeah, that that could explain a lot there. In fact, the NYPD used Israeli training to spy on Muslims. Why am I, why is this not a shock? From 2003 to 2014, this included mapping out Muslim communities all over the Northeast, not just in New York, uh, is infiltrating mosques and recording conversations on the street between Muslims. The Mossad and the Sheen Bet are on the bleeding edge of surveillance and counterinsurgency technologies and techniques at this point. I think it's the sixth largest arms exporter in the world. It has 27 major surveillance companies, uh, which gives it the fifth largest private sector for surveillance. In all, uh, you're looking at about 6.5 billion dollars in weaponry sold every year on average. Their surveillance sector is no joke. They've been able to export this because they've been developing this for the purpose of genocide since their inception, pretty much. But moving on to the other major power in the Middle East right now. Did anybody see this that Iran a couple weeks ago basically gave the same speech that they make like every month? And Donald Trump went on Twitter like in the middle of the night Basically, Ship Post Supreme told the Iranian leaders that if they ever did that again, that he was going to uh, do something about it. I guess imply that uh, there would be military action for doing it. Actually, yeah, he did. He straight up advocated that uh, we were going to strike him if they did that again. Yes, that uh, amped up George W. Bush infective, the level of almost comical hyperbole that Donald Trump is known for in his threats of military action on Twitter. We've seen it a couple times before. It's funny and terrifying threats in equal measure of every time. military action on Twitter. Yes, but this is this is what the United States has um, devolved to, is <laughs> the leader of the United States goes on Twitter at midnight or 2 a.m. in the morning and ship posts to Iranian leaders devolved to let me tell you something son let me tell you something about american culture and the american economy it's about refinement okay we spend less time less energy less money with every single iteration of our culture's turnover we used to send letters get on television have these big nice expensive speeches now now we just do it with twitter we're moving forward you got a problem with progress my friends you got a problem with the way that americans use technology to push boldly forward into new reaches of efficiency in bullying smaller countries? I, I do have to admit, uh, the future is, is pretty, pretty interesting. I mean, who would have thought that you could declare war in 280 characters or less? The Australian government did come out and confirm that they do have reason to believe that the United States is ramping up for an attack on Iran and it's kind of interesting because like the story was from uh, the ABC News and that's the Australian broadcasting system not the American ABC it was kind of weird because there was this double speak element to the article I don't know if you guys read this where it's basically like yeah uh, we're preparing to strike but Yes and no, maybe there's involvement from other countries. Yes and no, the Canadians might be involved. Like, it, it was so, it was very, very weird in how the information was conveyed. And I didn't see any other sources that confirmed or like it was all pretty much the same article just respawn where the Australian government said that they have information that the U.S. is preparing for an attack. And they got the uh, information through the Pine Gap facility via Five Eyes, which is their spying network for the United States, the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. But they really didn't explain the context around it. Hey, you want to hear a really bad take? What? This is because of Korea. I think I, I, think I get where you're going with this, but elaborate, please. We were ramping up our awesome military to go and just like... Space Force the shit out of Korea. Rah! 
And then, you know, out of nowhere, for reasons that are probably well beyond the grasp of our Commander-in-Chief, we just ended up not doing that. So there's all this vitriol, all this ramping up, all this, all this boiling over, all this America has to be strong. And, you know, we didn't go invade North Korea, and we didn't show them and show the whole damn world how hardcore and cool and sweet our uh, 51% of our national budget going into defense actually is. So now the focus hasn't been shifted, just the target. Well, I mean, historically, America always beats the drums of war. I mean, there, there's only been maybe, I think it's, there's a, there's a study done that showed military actions. And I can't remember, but I think it was less than 20 years of the United States' entire history has actually been peaceful with no military actions. 22 years. 22 years. Thank you. Was born, we have spent 22 years collectively not at war. Is this like full-blown invasion, topple the government, get ourselves stuck there for another, you know, 50 years? Or is this like we fire some missiles and say, don't do it again? My guess like, is this would this will probably be like the Syria attack where we just fire some missiles. That's what the Australian government seems to think in this particular case is it's going to be a missile attack. And really, that's how we kind of conduct war anyways these days. We really have to kind of get stuck in a situation for them to really want to put boots on the ground because that means committing, that means loss of life. It means it means a lot of things that a lot of Americans don't really want and could be the trigger to to an anti-war movement. I think one of the reasons why, you know, getting back to the anti-war movement thing, like we were discussing earlier, that we don't really have one is because we don't really see the consequences even when there is a is a war a lot of people really really haven't felt the consequences of the, the even the iraq war because compared to vietnam compared to korea compared to world war ii you just because of technology we don't see the casualties the casualties are on the other side well again i think as far as the idea of the anti-war movement is concerned that might be the one reason that uh, the powers that be are trying to turn away from open maneuver warfare and openly in invading other countries is even during the Iraq war, even during the, the, the Gulf War before that, even during uh, Vietnam, those wars were all heavily televised. And what's a good term here? Fucking awesome. Genuinely awesome. Watching the might of our military go up against something that gave a bit of resistance was awe-inspiring to a lot of people. It was uh, mesmerizing. It was great television. So a lot of it got televised. There's a lot of people who are aware of it. There are a lot of people looking through television screens or computer monitors at video from handheld cameras, from correspondents and journalists and soldiers who are actually there, as if they themselves are there in those muddy or sandy boots. And I think that would foment a lot of disagreement with the idea of warfare for the regular working class folks who are opposed to such things. But these shadowy proxy wars, these uh, give a dictator a pill or, you know, shoot a few hundred people and dump them in mass graves and never talk about it again. The kind of warfare that America has been engaging in since the very beginning, a linear warfare, guerrilla warfare, that's less publicized. It doesn't make great TV and it therefore doesn't generate a, a, a huge movement opposed to it in the working class yeah you know no one no one feels any effects until someone feels effects of it people are feeling effects for it like the you know immigration in europe not here because immigration here is all about how do we get free mexican slaves no like immigration in europe that's all them feeling the result of the iraq war that's everyone going there because we made their countries un unlivable that's another thing is that uh, america doesn't have to Put up with the consequences of the actions that it takes in the so-called old world because there's an ocean surrounding them and people can't really migrate so easily to america so it's europe and all of our allies and former allies that have to do the uh, cleanup work and deal with the re uh, with the refugees you do actually see a little bit more of a anti-war movement in Europe, actually. That is, a, that is a little bit of a thing. 
yeah in in america because of all of the factors that kind of isolate us from most of our military targets we don't see a huge anti-war movement and a huge push and with technology kind of taking the place of soldiers in battle it multiplies that effect and it means that there's a social cost to being anti-war because then you look like the crazy liberal or the hippie or, or whatever and you're somehow just being unpatriotic how sustainable is all of this really like how, how how much more can we do this until the economy just absolutely collapses because it can't sustain itself anymore which will probably happen sooner than later i mean it's just like this is this is kind of what did the romans in really it's the same thing well uh, put yeah it's it's just on a different time scale i mean heck um rob likes to always point out in the chat about the lead poisoning of boomers being exposed to lead as, as a kid and all these other chemicals. I thought that was your conspiracy. I thought you were the one who said boomers are nuts because of lead. I, I thought he I thought he was telling you you were full of shit. No, no, no. That's I, I actually kind of disagreed with him on the, on that one. But I could kind of see where some of it is an element, okay? Because a lot of the effects that we are seeing in the older population uh, with you know, like the alt-right and stuff like that, and with the, the localities that it's occurring in and everything, it does make a lot of sense that maybe that is not necessarily the primary factor, but a factor in all of all of this. Even, even down to, like, the lead issue, I mean, and the, the chemical issue, like with the Romans. Then you had the overextending of military power, and now we're even using contractors for a lot of things, which... The Romans used contractors. They just called them mercenaries. <laughs> the, the second, the fucking second Death Star. Please don't do you, compare do you know, America to Rome anymore. You know, do you, they, you know whatever yeah. you, you use contractors? I thought about the scene from Clerks where they dissect the second Death Star and why it was immoral to blow it up because it had a bunch of plumbers on it because it wasn't finished. I would imagine that the Death Star would take a lot of contractors just to maintain and operate. You can't really use that argument. And then secondly, and I don't mean to sound cold, but they did know what they were signing up for uh, to begin with. That was the, have you, have you seen Clerks? Because that was the conclusion that the contractor, the roofing contractor who was in the store when they were having a conversation came to saying that he had turned down a bunch of mobsters contracts and sent it to a friend and this friend got killed in the hit. See, now I have to watch Clerks again because it's been forever since I've seen the movie. So for our main topic tonight here, I did want to discuss the alt-right because just like always, they're on their bullshit. I actually have something special here because one of the things that the alt-right does is they always like to claim that they're the victim, that they're having their free speech ripped from them and everything. They, they're they always about that free speech, right? They, they, they should get to say whatever they like because of free speech. And everybody should have it, not just them. They're, they're, they're even free speech for you. Well, are they? Uh, let's let's find out here. So what I did was is I actually uh, I, I brought in a special guest here for the show. Attica's good buddy, Richard Spencer here is actually going to take over here my, for a second. My good, my good buddy, what? My chum? Yes, yes, your you're good buddy, uh, your, your friend Richard Spencer. You're, you're going to love this. Here's what Richard Spencer had to say about free speech. Uh, but as far as government regulation, I mean, yes, I think in the short term we would favor government regulation of speech, but long term, uh, are we even pro-free speech? No, of course not. But we have to use this platform in order. So we're, we're being radically honest here. And, yes, yeah. radically pragmatic. Yes. Okay. So, so there you go. From 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 his mouth, they don't give a shit about your free speech. I want to put this in the context of actually what he was uh, talking about here. So the reason that they were talking about social media is because, as you could imagine, they were discussing basically just being deplatformed off of several different. Uh, social media sites including Facebook and Twitter during that conversation and were upset that the Facebook algorithms and moderators were taking down their stuff 
And there was this conversation that the alt-right was having at the time that, ironically, these social networks should be treated as public utilities. Oh, when they accidentally stumble into leftism. Well, they, they stumbled into leftism because they essentially had no other choice because, like they said, they were being uh, pragmatically radical, I believe was the, uh, the term that the uh, host of the show was using. But this really just goes to show that you can't reasonably argue with the alt-right. Attica, you'd actually showed me this great graphic. It kind of actually looks a little bit like a black hole and it was just like one big giant singularity of bad faith arguments and it basically broke down how they have a private narrative that it's things that they discuss among themselves on the alt-right and then they have a public narrative and it's surrounded the private narrative is surrounded by all of these other articles to keep the public in the mainstream bamboozled basic bamboozled um but mostly wasting their time you know um the, the alt-right is basically just one massive interference machine right if you can get a liberal to waste two hours of their day citing sources that you're just going to throw in the garbage and go round and round and switch topics the minute they start to get an edge on you uh, until they give up and go home and you can go, I want, I want, I want, and jump up and down. Um, that's two hours of their day that, like, they couldn't do anything serious about you. I mean, you know, whether liberals would be willing to do, to go to the lengths that it would take, I don't count you know, FDR even as a liberal, like he was a social democrat, but like he freaking like Americans were willing to do shit then, you know, like I can't take call your con call your Republican congressman and say to protect Mueller. Like I can't read that again without throwing up. Like that's just so use you know, it, it's mostly time wasters and interference so that make liberals and quote leftists because they conflate the two all the time looks dumb and claim have a victory you can claim for yourself to back up your own narrative of liberals are dumb and you just waste a bunch of their time and effort right and then out of all of that you just cherry pick all of the stuff that doesn't sound clean out of context and then you just repost that to your forum buddies on 4chan or wherever and show how hateful liberals or socialists are or whatever it's by design it's it's to waste your time it's to get text clippings voice clippings etc and make a mockery of people as well it's all done in in bad faith it's it's performative arguments the thing is, is when you're engaging with these people, what they're doing is they realize that a lot of you know negativity sticks. So if you make a negative claim about something, then you're forcing the opposition to rebut it. So they're, they're always playing offense that puts us at defense. So one of the things that you should not do is you should never play defense with these people and you should combat them offensively when they go in with these tactics and not try to just answer their rebuttals cleanly with oh here in this source and this in this source and this source because people don't actually look at the source material and address it really kind of the only way to win against them is to be a bigger asshole you have to be you have to do it with snark like i think i honestly think that snarkiness is the left's best weapon right because we can we're really good at being jerks that guy who went to Syria, who was like everybody's favorite communist, I forget his real name, but like his Twitter handle was like pissed at or something. He was an asshole, <laughs> but everyone loved it because he was able to be funny while he was doing it. Like the alt-right don't have a sense of humor. They don't understand humor. Their sense of humor is, you know, a guy dies and ha ha, it's funny because he was a Jew or whatever. Well, all of their humor is based on punching down and not punching up, if you will. And that's the interesting thing is like comedy historically, even like edgy comedy, like George Carlin, it always punched in an upward direction. And that's what a lot of people that these edgelords don't understand 
when they're trying to do their little, you know, comic skits, and then they get called out for it because they're punching down. Yeah, they do. They, they fundamentally don't understand how to do it. Leftists can punch up and be a jerk, but they're punching up, so it's fun. It's great. It's galvanizing. I've never seen the right be able to counter it. And the other thing that they like to do is they, they do like to just outright lie as well. Oh, God, if you go through fucking alt furries chat, it's it's nothing but lies. It, Hitler got, you know, saved everyone from being poor and there was no homeless food and just just shit that's fed to just uh, gullible people who wander the hell in there. Because, oh, why does everyone hate these people? Oh, they, you know, I'm a furry. I'm, I'm obligated to... Uh, protect the, the downtrodden and give people the benefit of a doubt because I was an outcast and I had no friends in high school either and everyone bullied me so everyone's bullying these guys and they're the underdog so they gotta be the good guys so they stumble in there and they go oh what you mean I Hitler didn't kill a million Jews billion zillion they kind of groom people in that already have this mindset that they deserve better in life and that they're entitled to something and so it's it's very easy to turn that into the whole like birthright narrative that the alt right likes to push on about being white and being entitled to just everything pretty much. But all oh, furry like Xanadu, I've I've seen enough of it to know what you're talking about. And it is it's obnoxious. I mean, and their private narrative is exactly that. Their private narrative pretty much them just complaining all day about two or three furries that we all know the names of and I'm not going to mention here, then complaining about the Jews or Mexicans or black people or how refugees are raping all of Europe using false statistics that are spun to create the narrative that they want to create. And when I say Xanadu, that's that's a uh, alt-furry uh, chat room that is particularly very nasty. The alt-right just in general, they've been really going off on this this guy in South Dakota that had gotten arrested. He had like the materials to make bombs and everything. And it turned out he was in possession of an Antifa jacket. And the right wing went wild over this. They were like, yeah, we caught them. Antifa at it again. Uh, they're terrorists. Turns out, we don't know why the guy had an Antifa jacket. But what we do know is that the guy was entirely right wing cnn found their their social media profile and it did turn out that everything oh, on does there cnn actually do real news cnn did actually did real Antifa? news on this and they found that his social media profile and everything on twitter on facebook all together was all consistent he was entirely right wing he complained about sjw's the whole nine yards and so further investigation from a, uh, a local news outlet, they'd found that through his friends and family had confirmed that he was right wing. They described him as conservative and very pro gun right. You know why he had that jacket. We all know why he had that jacket. Oh yeah, he was he was trying to frame what exactly Antifa. What is a quote Antifa jacket? What do you, do you just write Antifa on it with paint? Where do, you, where do I get my Antifa jacket? Hot Topic? Didn't Soro send you one? the check in the front in the in the breast pocket <laughs> see i think yours may have been defective then yours didn't say antifa on it yeah you need to turn it back in you'll get he'll he'll hook you up don't worry but this is this is a thing though with with the alt-right they lie out their ass on this kind of stuff and then it gets found out but this isn't like one incident on the alt-right like between various groups and individuals, like we had the Austin serial bomber. He was an incel and a hard right conservative. I would consider him alt right with some of the stances that he he'd made uh, where he'd ranted against same sex marriages and the sex offender list, which is always a red flag. Always with the always with the sex offending and, and the excusing it. Then there was the Parkland shooter. We know that he was incel and alt-right. He had statements against blacks and Muslims and Antifa. There was the Toronto hit-and-run incident where the guy ran over like 20 people. There was the Miami arson attempt where the guy tried to burn down an apartment complex that he previously lived in to kill all the Jews in it that were somehow his fault for being evicted. And then there was a another like, bombing attempt where a guy was actually making bombs in his apartment. And he was 
an alt-right guy as well. And that was in Beaver Dam back in March. Th these are all incidents that happened this year. So we're looking at one, two, three bombings, or three bombers, I should say. They, they were either building or they were successful. An arson, a hit and run, and a mass shooting. And the alt-right wants to sit here and say that the left are the violent ones when they're the ones out there committing multiple terror attacks. They were all mentally ill, challenged, lonely, lonely, lone wolves. Well, all the white ones were. Well, yeah, that's that's what the, the media narrative would, would have you believe. Uh, anytime that it's, it's a white person, they rarely ever aired that. And one of the reasons that I actually, I you notice that I didn't air any of the names, and that's actually because if I want to refer to these people, I want to refer to the incidents in a manner that doesn't glorify the person that committed the crime in this particular case. I, I don't want to glorify that individual. Actually, an another Coast to Coast guy, Ian Punnett, kind of agrees with that. And he actually made some very good points a few weeks back on, uh, which I, I really appreciated those, uh, those viewpoints on that, that that's something that the media needs to start doing is not covering the individual per se, just giving the, the very basics, saying, yeah, he was affiliated with such and such group. They're all right. This is what they believe. Move on from there and don't spend the 24 hour news cycle covering the psychotic serial killer. Everything that the alt right says in their own public narrative is projection. It's claiming that they're the victim when their own people out there that follow their ideologies are out there killing innocent people. It's deflecting that. It's creating dog whistles to signal out to other alt-righters that they are there, they're present, and make jokes about these attacks or encourage other attacks without actually telling people to go out and do it. Well, I mean, in particular in the incel community, which is fundamentally hard right, look at the, the reverence for uh, Elliot Rogers. Yeah, well, they call him the supreme gentleman, if you will, uh, which is extremely gross. They, they have this reverence for this guy that they have elevated to sainthood. It's a very dangerous thing, and that's why the media needs to stop pushing the names of these people and, and who they were and focus on the victims, maybe even cover like the ideology that's spreading it, but cover it in a manner that portrays it for what it is. And, even, and if they do cover the perpetrator, they need to make it known that this individual is in fact bad. And the last thing that the media needs to stop doing is they need to stop masking it as some mental illness or the product of being bullied and face reality that millions of people have mental illnesses. Millions of people have been bullied. The majority of those people do turn out fine. They turn out to be normal, wonderful people for the most part. This is a very, very small segment that get pushed into this. And a lot of these people that claim to be bullied are not actually being bullied. This is just a victim status that they're putting on themselves. And usually it's because you're not letting me say the jokes I want to say. You're bullying me. You're telling me to shut up. Free speech, pr free speech, free speech. You know, it just goes to show every time they scream free speech, as Richard Spencer himself said, it's bullshit. They don't want free speech. They're using free speech so that they can get their message out. But the second that free speech becomes a detriment to their power once they do get in power, then that's going to go away and they will target leftists. This happens every time people like this come to power. But the communists didn't have free speech. You couldn't own wage slaves and run a business. It's tyranny. You couldn't say that you should be able to pay other people into poverty uh, so you could have a mansion. You know, free speech 
don't you understand that if I can't afford a second Escalade this year, I'll have to dock your pay. I work hard and I deserve that second Escalade. But speaking of these freaks being able to say whatever they want... Jim Jones, just in the ultimate Jim Jones? Did I just... Yeah, no, I just totally... Uh, I, I just totally made a Freudian slip there. <laughs> it's okay, Dad. <laughs> no, um, uh, Jim Jones was the Jonestown guy. That's, that, that's the wrong Jim. Uh, no, Jim Jordan. I guess it might as well be. I thought you were going to say Alex Jones. No, no, these no. These people's no. names, God. Is this... Jim, John, Jack, Rich. They're Bob, white people names, okay? Josh. This guy, right, Jim Jordan, he's the top pick for the Speaker of the House if the Republicans remain the majority party after the election. So I, I want to give you guys a taste of just what's to come down the line. So he was actually involved in a wrestling scandal where a bunch of former OSU, that's Ohio State, not Oregon, wrestlers came forward with claims of being sexually harassed and molested by a team doctor named Richard Strauss. Now, apparently Jim Jordan knew that this was going on, but refused to address the issue. So very similar to uh, the, to the like Sandinsky thing with Penn State in many ways. I mean, you see this a lot in college athletics, unfortunately, but the wrestlers came forward. So Jim Jordan and his buddy, Mike DiSabato, decided to say that it was all fake news, that the wrestlers have ties to the deep state, and there's no proof whatsoever of any of their claims. Like, this goes to show just the level that the, the political dialogue has become, that anybody speaking out against the Republicans and against anything that they do is fake news and part of some deep state conspiracy. A bunch of, like, not even football, just wrestlers. Yeah, they all secret uh, CIA. When I was in high school, I would frequently catch the coaches who doubled as the math teachers to pass all their athletes through math. Uh, they would invite their special athletes to uh, drink booze with them out of flasks in the office and then draw the blinds. So this doesn't surprise me. Yeah, and of course, we all know that, like, education in the United States is heavily corrupted by athletics. One of the things that people of uh, right wingers like to throw out there is that uh, America spends too much on education because we spend more money per child than any other country. Yet we get like the least benefit from it. What they don't tell you in that fact when they talk about cutting education is that that money is mostly going towards athletic programs and feeding in, into that particular system of schools. It's not going towards the students. What they're doing is they're taking the amount of money that is given total for education and then dividing that by students and saying, plop, this is how much is spent per student. But just getting back onto to the main topic here, the, the alt-right and their politicians are just fully on board the USS make shit up. The aircraft carrier keeps spitting out lie after lie after lie. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Incredible. The right wing is awesome. <laughs> they, they get to say pretty much whatever they want, and they're not held accountable for, for any of it uh, by their voters. And I, I really do hope that this does reflect when we go to the polls. I'm kind of on the fence that there, there is actually going to be a blue wave. I, th I think that the liberals are hyping themselves up too much simply because the blue that's coming in to replace it for the most part is just the same neoliberals with a few exceptions here and there like Ocasio and, and a few other progressives. If the Democrats want to win, they need to put the progressives, they need to put the democratic socialists out there so that we could vote for them because the working class and especially the millennials, which make up one of the biggest vote blocks within the Democratic Party, they're not going to turn out for Hillary Clinton. They're not going to turn out for Maxine Waters. They're not going to turn out for Harry Reid or 
or Nancy Pelosi. We're over that. That era of politics is over. We're fed up with it. We've had 35 years of it and we want to be done with it. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in my state in Arizona. I don't know how many people around the country know who Kristen Cinema is, but everyone hates her. The entire Democratic Party here hates her. Like, she's never campaigned once in her life. She's never gone to talk to people. She just has Hillaryed her ducks up in a row and uh, has all the bright people paid to the point where I was getting calls from the Democratic Party office. Do you plan on voting for Democrats? Yes. Do you, do you, do you always support Democrats and vote down ballot? Yes. Will you come and knock doors and make phone calls for Kristen Cinema? And I'm thinking, like, isn't there a primary? There are other people running against her in the primary for Senate. Yeah, it might be a long shot because she's got all her ducks lined up in a row and the Democratic Party has already decided that she's going to be there and be the candidate because the primary has not happened and they're trying to get people to come knock on doors. And I just sort of like fake said yes because I wasn't going to have anything. I wasn't going to yell. Like I wasn't in the mood to like deal with this guy. And it was such, such a difference from when I get calls from the social Democrats that I campaign for. Because yes, I know, you know, all, all of Reddit's going to scream at me, oh, they're going to betray us and they're not going to do anything. And yeah, probably. But, you know, I'm also flexing my muscles to see what I can do and what I'm capable of. I, I see no well, problem vo voting for a social Democrat because the worst that can happen is that they're just going to lose. If you don't try in the electoral system, I mean, there, there's always a chance that it might not it might not go that way. And yeah, there's a chance that maybe they're not going to turn out to be what they said they were. There's a good chance of that happening. Yeah. But the alternative is the zany part of the Republican Party getting in power everywhere. And yeah. we really have to ask ourselves, is that really what we want? Because the people that, that are coming to power on the alt-right that are running in these elections for the Republican Party, they are just fully advocating pretty much yeah. just to stand down on things like LGBT rights. I mean, do you really want an attorney general in your area or a state prosecutor that doesn't want to prosecute rape cases and deprioritize them? I mean, because that, that's, I mean, what's, what, that's what's going what to happen. Essentially, voting for a social democrat, even though you know that it's probably not going to materialize in anything like you don't really have anything to lose. So I campaign for them. And when I get their phone calls, they're happy and excited. When I get the phone call from the schmuck at the Democratic Party central office, he sounds like he wants to blow his brains out. Uh, there was a poll that came out recently that says 1%, only 1% of this country thinks that the Russia thing is a big deal, is an issue worth devoting time and attention to. And that's all that nationally they're beating the drum for. Now, like, I focus on local elections, more local elections mostly. But, you know, I can already tell you that, like, the Social Democrats, they basically are already their own party. They're not getting any support from the actual Democratic Party. They're shut out. They're running as Democrats, so they have to get access to, you know, the campaign materials, the van, the day the voter database. But they're getting no money. They're getting no material help. You know, the Democratic Party is not trying to get people to come and, and volunteer for them. They're shutting them out as much as possible. And they're already pre-deciding the primary by asking people to come and campaign for their chosen candidate before the primary is even won for Senate because they just, you know, have all the right money and the wheels greased and they just know that it's going to be Kristen Cinema. And Kristen Cinema has never, ever put forward a bill in Congress. And she's running to replace Jeff Flake in the Senate. In Congress, she's never, ever put forward a bill that wasn't co-signed by a Republican. And she's not a Democrat. Like, she's not even a neoliberal Democrat. And everyone hates her. But, you know, she's pre-selected to go up there to run for Senate and she's going to push Russia and she's going to say, if you don't vote for me, you're going to get, you know, our pile or whatever evil Republican makes it there. And she'll lose badly and horribly. And that's what I'm, I'm afraid of here uh, with this whole like blue wave thing is that they keep conflating it and everything. Like, they keep hyping it up and everything. If they're not careful, they're going to have egg on their face because the corporate Democrats, all they're doing is screaming Russia, 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 when 
they're not addressing any issues that affect working class people and that plays into the alt-right that's that's why there's a flight there people see that the democrats aren't addressing core issues that matter to the working class they'd rather play this russia game and blame putin for every little thing that goes wrong than address the fact that it's the cronies in the united states that are making life difficult for everybody else the thing about voting social democrat is that it needs to be shown time and time again in election after election at the grassroots and at the highest levels that those are the people that we want to vote for. We're not going to Pokemon go to the polls for the same old song and dance that's being offered time and time again that fails us time and time again. And not to sound like an accelerationist, naturally, but even if we lose to the right a couple more times, the Democratic Party needs to realize that we're not going to vote for these same spoiled rich children. We're going to vote for people who on the ground floor advocate for real changes that will really affect the working class. But I don't even think the Democratic Party cares about winning ever again. I don't think they care about holding power because they don't have any platform. They don't have any plan. They don't have anything they want to do that's different from the Republicans. So they don't care about getting in power again because they're getting all their money anyway. They just, they no, frankly they, don't give a crap. Of course the Democratic Party wants to win. They want to win so that the Republicans can't, you know, knock down LGBT protections or whatever. So their nice rich corporate friends can sell rainbow capitalism to every demographic that the Republicans don't care about. It's all about money. It, well, okay, so the thing is, is Democrats better care about winning because if they don't win in the United States, Europe is swinging right right now in a very bad way. It's kind of come a little bit suddenly. We see this a lot in Central Europe and, and in Eastern Europe, like Poland, uh, parts of Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, Czechia, which is the former Czech Republic, and Italy, of course. Uh, Steve Bannon has basically declared that he wants to fund a organization which he calls the movement which is going to act like a right-wing version of the open society which is george soros's organization so he basically bannon just wants to be a right-wing version of soros with less money i'm guessing but so you're telling me that as a centrist i can collect soros bucks and bannon bucks yes you can collect both and it will probably be really bad what makes this particularly dangerous is it's he's trying to basically galvanize all of the European alt-right parties and kind of the movement is the organization the move is it's going to be a think tank for these parties it's it's going to act as like a resource center to spread right-wing populism to groups and the disturbing thing about it is like the model He's already pointed to a model government in Europe that, that he sees as being the future. And it's Italy Salvini, which if you all recall, Salvini is the one that uh, made this call a few weeks ago for trying to remove the Roma from Italy, that he wants to do a census and then kick out all of the Roma. See, as... A hard leftist, I'd call that a model government in that not unlike a model, it's plasterboard thin and extremely fragile and more flammable than it is fragile. Yeah, and Italy right now is on the verge of chaos, which is really interesting that he he cites Italy as being the model on that one, because like you said, it's the walls are thin and it looks like it's about to collapse. I could only imagine that what he's, he really means here is just that, that he wants the system to be such that it, it collapses into this chaos and creates this, I guess, pan-European alt-right vision of what Europe should be. So essentially, they, they just want to be able to duke it out with leftists in the street. That's yeah, pretty, pr much pretty much that. And they have a hard-on for Europe, but like... 
I don't think that they realize like Europe is like composed of like several different like it's weird how they talk about it right like they they talk about like being nationalists on one hand and then they they like idolize like the entire freaking continent to Europe so it's like one big like double think of white supremacy and then like there's this whole like chain and this of different like levels of like whiteness within Europe and it's it's freaking weird looking at all of this and knowing that Bannon and other people on the right are trying to galvanize what is already a dire situation in Europe at the same time that we're fighting the alt-right in America. If America and Europe fall to this ideology, it could get really dangerous. Because dun 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 like that's pretty much gonna be what we're all falling to. I mean, we're gonna go kiss C's boots and and pray for him to save the world if he even gives a shit. Because it's not like there's any actual Marxism left in China, but they they don't seem to be going in this direction. Yeah, I think it's. It is very important for the left everywhere to galvanize and stand against the the alt-right in all of their forms all over the world. It may be necessary pretty soon to pull out the stops and go, unfortunately, by any means necessary if the uh, the right wing have their way in America after the election. And I really do hope that that doesn't happen, but... I, I don't think that we should be counting on the liberals to show at the polls because <laughs> liberals are pretty finicky voters. Yeah, no, like it's not going to like the liberals are just going to die, right? Like if they do not gain a majority, they're dead, right? They'll do the thing they always do where they claim a loss as a win because they lost a little bit less than last time. You know, we got 10 more seats. Woohoo, blue wave. And then they'll just die. Like, they'll just be wiped off the face of the earth. And it'll be up to us. And we're going to go be malice in the bushes and eat rocks. And that's our life. Almost makes me want to move to Rojava because at least they have six years on us. And the situation in Europe is dire right now. Like, we covered on the last show, there's already a, a task force designed and designated to create huge dossiers on leftists. And then plug it into a face recognition system so that uh, police can just arrest whomever using the special glasses in the future or just kick down somebody's door in the middle of the night, you know, when the government gets that itch to do it. Right now in Poland, it's actually boiling over right now. The, uh, the PIS, which is the Law and Justice Party, which ironically stands for neither law nor justice. Uh, has been cracking down on left-wing activists. They recently disrupted an academic conference uh, in May that was organized by Sechen University, and they took the names of people and the photos of the attendees, which was illegal, and they had no right to do it. And a similar thing happened in April where they kicked down a website owner's door and seized laptops and hard drives for the guy for propagating the communist system when there's no law prohibiting such. And then they also took down the Communist Party of Poland Facebook page and had their newspaper banned. They weren't breaking any laws either. Well, I mean, that's also indicative of a powerful left too, right? Like, I mean, that that's what always happens to us right before we win. Maybe so, but in, in this case... The, the right in Poland is really surging right now. The, the PIS, the, the Law and Justice Party there, are essentially just fascist sympathizers at this point. They're like beyond conservative for the most part. And they've created this red scare in Poland that pretty much they've interpreted the law, uh, which states that advocation of totalitarian practices is what they can actually ban communism under when none of these organizations that they actually went after were actually advocating said authoritarian systems like they weren't stalinist or or, or maoist even like it wasn't in that vein and however they did try to to make 
communism and advocating it illegal through a constitutional tribunal, but they failed. Oh, okay, so that's Poland. But, you know, the, the, the seat of Europe rests with France, Germany, and England. That is Europe. France, Germany, and England is Europe. I wouldn't count Poland out. Like, so many people do, and so many people like to ignore East and Central Europe. The reason that we have so much focus on France, on the UK, and on Germany is because of the, th their empires in many ways are still relevant. Like, there's still relics of it around. As far as European politics go, what's going on in, in Poland is very, very relevant because of how it is spreading out and the fact that people like Spencer and like Bannon that's creating these think tanks, they're looking at Poland and Italy and all of these other movements within these countries as models to which to spread to France, spread into the more liberal areas of Germany and the, uh, the UK. But the other danger here with the Law and Justice Party in Poland is that, of course, they're steering Poland into this red panic, but they're also accusing re the Reformist Party and other parties of being communist and calling for them to be delegalized. They're effectively neutering any semblance of not only liberalism, but of course socialism as well. So they're basically chopping off not only just the left, but the left half of the right wing spectrum as well. I mean, you know, the, the fourth, fifth sentence of the Communist Manifesto, what party in opposition has been decried as communist? And most people don't become communists. Most people don't take on a revolutionary attitude until they've suddenly been disenfranchised and realize that their state is their enemy and is coming to attack them. Every, every single communist revolution that happened happened on the heels of a successful fascist seizing of power or invasion. You know, Yugoslavia successfully beat back the Nazis and Lenin got into power because the liberals told him to help, help us from the white Russians. And then he got rid of the liberals and just took power. Yeah, this is scary, but this is also typically what happens before we win somewhere because it's impossible that this would just happen everywhere you're not going to have a uniform europe of fascism especially not in, like i said earlier the big three of britain and germany and france because those all fascists try to make a move there and you know <laughs> the, the alt-right scared of antifa here there you know they actually do make bombs and they do blow up stores <laughs> And they do um, put their lives on the line. Well, like I said, you know, Bannon is trying to put up a force to embolden the, the alt-right in Europe, both on the voting front and on the, uh, the, the ground. We need to make sure that we're present as well and, and ready to uh, tackle them. I think Antifa in Europe is, uh, and like you said, much more willing to do so than, than in America. It really is a very precarious situation. So from the, the mega bourgeoisie of Europe to the petite bourgeoisie of the United States, Seattle landlords are angry that they can't own serfs and own their tenants. Quote, if you don't make the money, why do you have a right to live in the city? If you don't just have one of the limited tech jobs, uh, why, why should I uh, let you live in my ginormous apartment tower with bad plumbing so yeah this survey um landlords in seattle just do not get the plight of the uh, the common man here uh, they are asking for the guillotine if if you will there was a survey done where or 89 percent of the respondents in the uh, the survey uh did not agree with uh, the following proposals and none of these proposals had more than one percent of support and that was increasing the supply of units providing affordable housing and making it easier to terminate leases the other thing that they voiced massive opposition to was discrimination based on source of income and move-in deals so employ you know like giving discounts for working for a certain employer because that's not feudalism right right and then also, like they don't like the idea of requiring payment plans for move-in fees. You know, when you have to pay a huge deposit 
and processing fees plus an application fee and all that and it ends up you're spending a thousand two thousand dollars to move into some crappy apartment and they're not wanting to, to split that up although some do uh, renting to the first qualified applicant they were against that uh, which means that they get to discriminate against who they they rent to and then of course barring tenants based on criminal record which they said was a safety thing however that just makes things harder for people that are trying to get their life in order if you're going from an idealist mindset not idealist as in oh you're an idealist you just believe in perfect world but like idealism versus materialism an idealist mindset of people are criminals so they make poor choices well now they're trying to make quote good choices as if those exist and getting kicked in the balls for it because how you know they they can't like you commit one crime and you might as well just go to jail for life because otherwise you're not gonna have a home right and like you said the the landlords were completely apathetic to the the needs of the renters that, that live in these units one of the interesting things about the survey is that they didn't mention her by name but they alluded to her Kashama Sawant, which is a socialist city council woman as well. They absolutely dislike this woman because she's fording these types of policies that we mentioned above to make things easier for tenants to, to live. And they actually even had the audacity of saying that they weren't being represented in their district. That's how far off these landlords are time to be malice i really want to see like if anarchists actually succeed in the u.s and like bring about an anarchist order of society if they're actually going to do anything different like no they're going to haul those landlords out and beat the shit out of them too yeah yeah they'll just they'll do what what the malice did in china to the uh to the landlords i mean can we can we blame them i mean because the landlord's responses to all of this by the way was just disinvest in in their properties it closed down units tear down units to build even smaller units just stop renting in seattle and just outright you know close the unit up it, it's just absurd and so really i think what people need to do is i think i think these tenants not only do they need to get together and they need to unionize but the other thing that they need to do as well is organize the what if scenario of what if the landlord does try to retaliate against them in this particular instance uh what if they try to close down the unit Maybe the goal of the uh, the union should be community defense and by community defense, kick out the landlord and take that SOB over. One thing I do, one, one question I do have about Marxism in the modern day is that in China, in Russia, when they would do that, like a lot of these places have wood burning stoves, you know, gaslight, um, candles. When things like power and water are so centralized, you know, let's say they do take over the apartment block. The landlord just goes to the power company to shut off the power. It goes to the water company. Well, shut off the water. Actually, um, they uh, they can't do that. And also, well, I mean, why? So the way it's okay, illegal? so so the the way that that like, actually what's the works. Thing stopping. Yeah. So actually, there is something stopping them. So the landlord does not typically pay the utilities. The utilities are deeded in the names of the tenants. That's how it works in my apartment for instance and that's how it's worked for almost every apartment that i live in if they did that they would actually be violating a law but the other thing is is there are other laws that that would violate for instance a landlord cannot actually shut your power off to get you to move out uh it's a, it's a safety hazard right and but they so, can't do it so we already see that the law works great up until it starts to work against their favor and then they uh, gather together as a class and the water company says oh shit you know i might lose my property and then do it and then fuck the law the police will just beat up and shoot whoever the bourgeoisie tell them to shoot up so the good thing about the the utilities is is that they are ran by the, the the city in this case seattle which is more left-leaning there's less of a chance of that happening than say oh houston it it is a concern I'm not, I'm not going to totally write it off as being something that would be be like a 0% chance of happening. But 
Also, I could see that there could be some sympathy there. Also, legality with Seattle being the way that it is. I don't think that they would do that. The other thing is, is that the tenants, if they know how to do so, could also just turn the stuff right back on as well. Of course, you know, you're talking about risking some jail time if you get caught doing that. If they're if they're desperate enough or if uh, they, they deem it necessary, they might just do it. And they might just decide to run the place. There's also something empowering about that too, right? Like when the power goes off and I suddenly realize that like I have to like light candles, I suddenly feel alive, right? I think it's the quote, the revolution, if it comes, when it comes, uh, people will feel alive for the first time in their lives. I think for the most part, because, you know, they spend most of the day sedated, walking around, get this drink, eat this heavy food, um, you with no control over their lives, just busting themselves from one point to another. And when you suddenly have to apply your brain to how do we get power? How do we get water? Yeah, it's a little disconcerting, but you also feel alive. You're like you, you have power over your own decisions and you're suddenly making choices. And once a person experiences that, it's very hard for them to forget it. Like, it stays with them as a ghost. When I went up my parents' friend's sister's farm ranch up in Northern California, was the first time I ever enjoyed work, to the point where I didn't feel like work. I was clearing the field, and the field could be planted, and the result of my work was self-evident. And it completely blew away forever the idea of a paycheck. And I have never lost that feeling. I've been looking for that feeling again in every work, every piece of work that I do. I definitely understand that. That's kind of how I felt uh, working at the uh, the vegan restaurant uh, many years ago. I've, I've never been able to have a job that really kind of gave me that same satisfaction of, of making something and then you know being able to present it. You're, you're definitely right there. That there there is something to be said about that. There's also something to be said about the feeling of organizing as well. So these people being able to go out there and commit to direct action is going to make them feel empowered in a way that they've never felt empowered before. Yeah, it's going to be where has this been all my life? That's exactly the reaction that I had when I was working on that ranch. Getting up, finding myself just doing it, not caring about hours or pay, just doing it. So speaking of people empowering themselves and taking direct action, somebody took direct action by unmooring Betsy DeVos's $40 million yacht and setting it adrift in Lake Huron. How adrift did it get? It sloshed around the marina and hit a few docks, causing about five thousand oh, and ten thousand so dollars in damage. Ah, oh, so it didn't it didn't go out into the middle of the lake. It'd probably be a lot of work to actually get it out that that far into the lake, unless there's like a storm or something. So, are you cleaning a gun too? No. <laughs> so this sort of coincides with something I've seen that I've been waiting to see. As much as I dumped on resistance Twitter in the very beginning of the episode that for the first damn time I saw them talk about we need to inconvenience their donors and I was like oh my god yes they're giving up on calling their fucking congressman and they're gonna start going and and ruining the lives of the CEOs that donate money to them like they're, they're figuring it out slowly but they're, they're getting there uh, is it too late? I don't know. But it was like, oh, finally. Like, it was a breath of fresh air when I saw that. It definitely. It definitely was. This is, it was great to see something I mean, as legal, as illegal as it is. It's it's great oh, to cares? see it. I, I mean, right. Who cares? This was, this was great. And I, I'd like to see more. I mean, she has 10 other boats. I mean, just, just saying. I mean, just saying uh, that, uh. A sizable, uh, sizable drill might, might, you know, come in handy. I don't know how those boats work. You know, do your research. But, <laughs> but oh man, th this was something else. And for it to be such like a high, like public official too. Like this wasn't, this wasn't going for like some low blow, you know, like low blow here. This was, this was a Trump administration official. So I got to hand it to them uh, that maybe hashtag the resistance is uh, finally waking up to things and hopefully they will they will actually get out there and do stuff. Hopefully we'll have that anti anti war rally as well. I don't know about the anti war rally, but I'd like to have honestly, I think an anti corporate rally would be far more effective than the anti war rally. 
I, mean, I think just at, well, we need to we need to bring attention to the atrocities that the United States is is committing in in our names as, as well. I I'd, I'd really like to see that be something that we push more and we do talk about more in leftist spheres because solidarity is international and it's it's really important that we we do empathize with our fellow workers be it if they were in texas in mississippi in new york in mexico in india or in yemen it's really hard there definitely is something to be said about first world communists and then third world communists. So it is really hard, A, to get news about things happening down in, in Mexico and in, quote, developing countries. And B, when you do, it's sort of hard to know what to do about it without, you know, being, you know, uh, Savior Barbie. Do you know about Savior Barbie? It was like this, this art project where someone like went around Africa with a Barbie doll taking Instagram pictures and, and making quotes of ridiculous things that like volunteer tourism. Uh, but other other news on the direct action front here, by the way, there are, there's going to be some rallies this month. Pretty much the alt-right is celebrating the one year anniversary of Unite the Right with Unite the Right 2. And they're kicking it off in four cities it, on the four. They're kicking it off in, in three cities. They canceled the city, uh, Seattle. Now, okay, so uh, they, they moved the rally. They didn't cancel it. They canceled the Berkeley rally and moved it to Los Angeles. So oh, huh. the, the rallies are on the 4th of August, Portland, Oregon. Um, well, shoot, I wish I knew about the, the LA one because like, that's easy that's possible yeah. for me to get to. And the LA one is on the 12th. The Washington, D.C. one is on the 11th. And Charlottesville... It looks like they were going to do like a two-day rally between the 10th and the 12th, and I really couldn't peg it down, so I don't know what's going on there. If it's the 10th, the 11th, or the 12th, there are multiple days, but it looks like they had something big planned there. However, talk has seemed to have been shifting towards moving the main rally on the East Coast to Washington, but there seems to be a lot of chatter about what's going on in Portland, and the guy that's running the rally in Portland joey gibson who's running for senate him and some of some of his friends have come out and made some very violent comments they actually moved the rally in portland to a place that's open carry so it really does look like they may be trying to create an excuse to use those weapons so i would say to anybody going to the portland rally which I, I may be going. I, I still don't know if I can I can get uh, the means to get up there. Be careful. Uh, one one thing that uh, I would recommend if if you are going there, bring things like tampons in case somebody does start shooting because those are great to uh, to, to tend to like a bullet wound or something like that. And I hate to have to say that, but uh, tampons. Um, unflavored Listerine, the yellow stuff, uh, works great as a uh, as an antiseptic so does of course peroxide alcohol iodine make sure you have some sort of antiseptic basically be aware of your surroundings there if if you're there as well so just make sure you have those medical supplies in order be aware of your surroundings don't entice them and don't approach them alone so that they could like encircle you or whatever and keep track of their movements as well that way if you as a group, Antifa or the counter protesters uh, need to maneuver, you can do so. And like the most important thing is to not take bait. Let, let them make the first moves. Don't don't take their bait into running at them or throwing stuff at them. Right. And, and there will there will, will be those people that try to approach you to like engage in what seems like a debate or seems like a conversation. And then they'll like sucker punch you or uh, try to, you know, freak you out so that it looks like you've thrown the, the, you know, the first punch or whatever. Definitely be aware of tactics that they use. And I would say don't actively work to confront them. And if they approach you, unless they it, it's obvious that they're looking for an attack, don't feed into their narrative so that they have it on camera. Because a lot of times they'll film these and then they will edit the reel to make them look like they're the good guy. Pay attention to 
other protesters around you and try to hold them back if they look like they're going to run in because, you know, there's always the chance that they're a cop who's going to run in to try to cause the problem and be the, the plant. Yeah, there, there's always plants, so you have to be careful about that. But thankfully, like, like a lot of times, like, you can kind of tell plants by their behavior and what they're wearing. Look at the brand of boots that they're wearing, if it, if it matches what the cops in the area are wearing. Generally, you'll have a match there, that kind of thing. So just kind of be attentive of what people are wearing and how they're acting and what they're saying, etc. Yeah, uh, like I said, it's, it's all about situational awareness and tactics and not being confrontational and also being prepared if there is a confrontation having those medical supplies available etc and if you can't even if you can't bring medical supplies maybe bring some Gatorade you know something like that something to give out the people so that, yeah or not Pepsi don't <laughs> I, 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 you, you have no idea how much I hate that that is a callback <laughs> I did not like. <laughs> it's also very, like, plants are, like, 90% of the time very how-do-you-do fellow kids. They're thrown into a situation with, in a, with a bunch of people with a culture because the left is very, very much has its own subculture around it uh, that, that they, they're, not, they're unfamiliar with. Like, they very, they're very obviously do stand out. I was reading an article today about a cop who had infiltrated very early on black lives matter group um through facebook chats and his name was john smith and he was like his icon was a damn guy fox mask like real how do you do fellow kids and i think it was only due to you know the newfound activist naivete that it even got that far like i don't think that would have flown i think the guy fox mask guy would have been pegged as a cop very early on and there were some uh, screenshots in the article of people telling them like you're a cop and then like kicking them out of the group chat but also like great just, um, 2008 reference there yeah and this was like in 2015 this is a very very how do you do fellow kids aspect to them oh yeah definitely so there there are some some obvious traits to look for too of course uh getting on to the last topic though we cannot do a show and not talk about our favorite guy on the right alex jones and you guys know I love to impersonate this guy. I do a great impression of him. But sometimes an impersonation just doesn't get the point across here. And I've you got... can't be better than this. <laughs> I, I, I can't be better than this. This tops everything that he has done. And I, I just I just want to play this and then just kind of kind of go over how surreal this is. So I present to you Alex Jones at his best. There's no video of President Trump sucking a ding dong. I never sucked any ding dongs, but I'll tell you, if they were gonna blackmail me to start World War III about one, I'd say, hey, I sucked a ball, golf ball through a freaking garden hose. <laughs> the audio doesn't do it justice. You have to go watch the video. Of okay, the yeah, so that is incredibly perturbed. <laughs> that okay, yeah, it, it, that is. If if you guys get a chance, go watch the video because. The audio to this is great. The look on Oscar's face, the guy's co-host, is just priceless. Like he's like leaned back, freaked out in his chair over this. <laughs> and he's like, whoa, dude, I didn't sign up for this. You need to bring Paul Joseph Watson in here if you want that. <laughs> Paul Joseph Watson has definitely sucked some ding-dongs. <laughs> Paul Joseph Watson here. Those, those, those lips have seen many a ding-dong. <laughs> Probably. Uh, the, the only thing I, I I am a little bit disappointed in the fact that he didn't use my particular favorite uh, euphemism, uh, which I, I really hope he does at some point in the future revisit this topic so I could get a, a, an audio clip of him saying, I'd suck the chrome off of a trailer hitch. <laughs> I, that just must be a Florida thing because I, I I'm I'm totally <laughs> clueless. Never heard that. I, I don't know what that is. That, that's a, that's definitely like a like a southern expression there. But oh man, that if that was not just a great clip to I, I just wanted to end on there for tonight. I think Alex Jones has definitely sucked some ding dong. <laughs> I think all of these people, primarily in their life, have or have a deep desire. To suck a ding dong and that 
their apprehension to just fucking enjoy sucking that ding dong is the source of many of their woes. If you look at the video, like, you kind of get that feeling. Either he is really massively uncomfortable at the idea of sucking the ding dong, or he secretly wants to do it, and that is what is distressing him. Like, God, like, just scream at the entire alt-right. Just fuck already. You know, if they if they all just got together and, and made love with each other, the, the world would probably be a better place. But I definitely don't want to see that on Pornhub. I'm just saying. Yeah, you know, you know that in the celebrity session somewhere, someone has made Alex Jones' Pornhub video. Yeah, well, there's probably, like, like what is it, like, Room 316, but for InfoWars? It's, it's Room 366. Yeah, How many of our yeah. listeners are actually furries? All, like, two listeners that are furries that get the joke. <laughs> yeah, all the other people who aren't furries go on YouTube, Room 366. Oh, God. Well, the video wasn't even that bad. Like, I thought it was kind of cool. Like, it was, it was risque. But it wasn't like, it didn't kill the fandom. Like, people got way up, just blew that way out, out of proportion. I thought do you, it want, was, do you want to be in a Room 366 video with me, Phelan? It's cool. 50 bucks. <laughs> 50 bucks, you'll take the knot. No, no, I, I won't. Uh, that's... God, now they're all going to Google knot. Just stop the show. We're done. <laughs> okay. But before we stop the show, I do want to thank all of our listeners here. Uh, definitely, you're the ones that we produce this show for. So thank you very much. If you liked our show, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, share it on social media, uh, share it on uh, the YouTube, on the SoundCloud, etc. And uh, get the word out about the show. Uh, that We really appreciate that. Uh, with that all being said, thank you very much. Good night and good luck.